Reporting in progress. Good morning um, and welcome to this launch event uh, of our economic governance uh, task force. I'm very glad uh, to have Jean-Pierre Vidal with us, uh, the chief economic advisor to the president of the European Council. Um, economic governance is something uh, we at the EPC have been interested in and looking at uh, for a long time. But of course, uh, the framework in which we are doing this has changed. Uh, the uh, COVID-19 crisis um, and uh, its economic impacts, but also the policy response to it, have changed uh, the discussion on economic governance. Um, but we think it is also very important that we pick up that discussion now, um, that we are also already preparing for what comes after this phase of the crisis and how do we react best in terms of the economic governance uh, we're going to set up. So the task force we've put into place aims um, to have these discussions and then to come up with concrete recommendations um, on what could be done, in particular focusing on three different areas, uh, the stability and growth pact um, and the question of fiscal rules, of enforcement of fiscal rules, um, and how we go back to normal after this exceptional period, um, also exceptional in terms of spending of member states um, has passed. The second area we're going to focus on is the European semester um, and the question of how that can be made more effective, how it will interact also with uh, the new um, instruments which are now available at the European level, um, what happens in the longer term, what kind of uh, mechanisms and instruments will we need, and uh, thirdly social investment, um, a topic which is uh, very dear to my heart, uh, it's something we have looked at for a long time, how can we make sure that social investment is not the first thing which suffers uh, in a crisis, how can we make sure uh, that there is a long-term approach, um, but which also uh, embodies responsibility, which is not just a free-for-all, but actually fits in uh, the overall governance framework. So these are the, the three areas we will be working on, um, but I'm sure we will touch on many different uh, aspects of economic governance. Um, so it's very useful uh, to kick off this task force um, with uh, a general overview and uh, I guess the political mood of where we are in terms of economic government governance. Um, so very happy to have you here, Jean-Pierre. Um, we will start with a 15 minute opening statement um, and then I will follow up with some questions, but I will also then open it up to the audience. Um, so if someone wants to speak, uh, then please put up your electronic hand or uh, write your question and I will come back to it uh, later on. Um, but uh, firstly, uh, Jean-Pierre, if I can ask you to make the opening statement uh, and then we can get into the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Fabian, and thank you for your invitation to, to deliver this, uh, this introductory, introductory statement. I would like to stress first that, I mean, I will share with you my personal perspective. And so these are personal remarks, I mean, more as an economist and also as, in some sense, a privileged observer, if you wish, of the evolution of our governance framework. And the history of this uh, economic governance framework started actually long ago with the Treaty of Rome. Well, this treaty, it established the common, what we call, I mean, what we then thereafter call internal and single market. And in fact, what is important to consider is that by signing this treaty, all the member states agreed to consider economic policy as a matter of co common concern. And actually, this provision is the origin of the provision we have in the current treaty. So if you look at the current treaty, Article 121 states, member states, and there I read, shall regard their, their economic policies as a matter of common concern and shall coordinate them within the council. Interestingly, if you look at the text of the Rome Treaty, Article 103, that is the 
article on which the current article is based. And for these articles, there is no original text actually um, in English because there, the treaty was signed. Uh, you know, you have the, the text in, in Dutch, in French, in Italian, and in, in, in Dutch uh, and German. Yeah. Um, it refers, I mean, the text refers to conjuncture politique in German and in French uh, in politique de conjoncture. So the wording then the, at that point in time reflected the spirits, in fact, I mean, really the spirits of the time and basically a consensus on the need for government to actively manage economic cycles. So this was the consensus of the times. As we all know, uh, this consensus for active macro macroeconomic management gradually went in the 80s towards a rule-based approach to macroeconomic policies. And first of all, in the area of monetary policy with the advent of inflation targeting and central bank independence. So there is a long history of EU economic governance. And what I would like to stress is that the words, the concepts we use are all time dependent. They depend on the evolution of economic and social paradigms, on progress in economic thinking, and also on societal and political changes. And they also depend on the economic, financial, and social challenges. So in a sense, I mean, the shocks, the economic shocks, the social shocks, if you wish, in, the, in, in jargon, it's an, the jargon of economists, but it depends on the shocks we are confronted with. So our current debate about economic governance depends on the challenges of our time, the social and political preferences, and actually also their current intellectual underpinnings. So today we'll start with what I would call a broad brush review of the evolution of the economic governance framework over the past 20, 30 years. Also, I mostly observed the past 20 years, but I mean, I will start, I mean, I will, I will look back 30 years. I will then share with you my take on the role played by the COVID-19 crisis in this debate. And I will conclude with a set of questions that I consider important to have in mind when thinking or rethinking economic governance today. So first, let me, let me uh, uh, have a look at this three-decade uh, debate uh, in the Union about, uh, about economic governance. And it's true that we have not been short of challenges over the past 30 years. And all of them, have left their footprint on our EU economic governance framework. So first of all, the European Union decided to establish an economic and monetary union with a single currency, the euro. And the Maastricht Treaty, in a sense, was a watershed in the history of economic governance, because sharing a single currency comes with additional requirements on the economic and fiscal policies of the member states. This was a time of the creation of an excessive deficit procedure. And of course, the well-known criteria that we have in the Maastricht Treaty, the 3% for deficit and the 60% from, from that, for that. It all came with a single currency. Regulations, of course, were subsequently built on the treaty. And this is what we, we call the Stability and Growth Pact. And then with that, with monetary unions, started a long political discussion about economic policy coordination and fiscal surveillance. And this already led us to two episodes, actually, of rethinking uh, of EU economic governance. First, in 2005, with the first reform of the Stability and Growth Pact. And then at that time, this reform aimed at including more economic rationale and more flexibility in the rules. And then you may remember some episode at that point, at that time, I mean, these were the year where the, even the commission president, I mean, Romano Prodi, called the Stability and Growth Pact stupid and rigid. rigid. This was in 2002. Remember also the collusion between Germany and France against a strict implementation of the excessive deficit procedure. Then the second reform resulted from the euro area sovereign debt crisis and went actually precisely in the opposite direction. So the titles, I think, of some of the additional regulations that were adopted at that, at that time in, uh, in, uh, after the, um, the crisis or during the crisis, uh, you know, dubbed the six-pack and the two-pack, I think are very telling of the new spirit of coordination that resulted from this crisis. I, I will just give a few examples because I mean, I found them so telling that I, I just want to, to read the title of some of these regulations. So 
regulation of the effective enforcement of budgetary surveillance in the euro area. So this regulation basically specifies sanctions in both the preventive and the corrective arms of the stability on growth packs, such as non-interest bearing deposits, fines, and also this regulation introduced more automaticity in the procedure with reverse qualified majority for the adoption of this, of this, uh, of this sanction. Another regulation, regulation on enforcement measures to correct excessive macroeconomic imbalances in the euro area, and regulation on the prevention of correction and correction of macroeconomic imbalances. Again, new procedures were introduced to prevent the emergence of economic divergences and ensure that economic policies of the member states are mutually compatible in monetary union. And actually, member states even signed a new treaty on stability, coordination, and governance, the so-called fiscal compact, to reinforce budgetary discipline even further. And it, for example, introduced the notion of an automatic correction mechanism in case of deviation from respective medium-term fiscal objectives. So you see, in the first decade of monetary union, we moved, we moved first full, full, full speed southwards and then full speed northwards. From flexibility on ownership in the first revision of the SGP to automaticity and sanction in the second revision. Well, it's clear, I mean, it's a broad brush, very simplified recollection of the, of the durations of the EU political debate on economic governance. But really the main point I want to establish is that the debate about economic governance is by nature dynamic, and that in fact rethinking, rethinking economic governance is part of our European history, and it's part of a history of building a sui generis union. So it's a very important debate. And I think that today's event and the initiative that you took, uh, Fabian, in the, at the European Policy Center to launch a task force, the task force on rethinking economic governance, actually just opens a new episode in this European journey. Let me now turn to the context, uh, the more specific context of the COVID-19 crisis and also its contribution to this debate. Here, I will first, uh, there are two points I would like to make. The first point is that the debate on EU economic governance started, of course, well ahead of the COVID-19 crisis. And in fact, the first impact of the crisis really was to put it on the back burner. As you know, the Commission intends to relaunch the review of the Stability and Growth Pact in the fall, and so it will make this debate a post-COVID-19 crisis debate. The second point I would like to stress is that in spite of all the limitations or flaws that you can find in our governance framework, the EU economic response to this crisis has been timely and effective. So let me say a few more things on my first point first, which is the permanent nature of our debate about economic governance. And here, I think to, to understand it, I think we should be aware that nothing is really written in stone. And it's well known actually in all area of laws that laws shape economic and social outcomes, for example, but reality also shapes law and amendments to law. So it's really a two-way process, and it's at, time, at times very dynamic because there are shock to the system, at times it's slower. So I have no doubt, for example, that if we, re we start to rethink today our economic governance framework, there will be a time where we will have to rethink it, for rethinking, rethink it again. But of course, obviously, we have to learn the lesson from the past, to learn the lessons also from the recent crisis, and adapt our policy framework to the, to, the need, to the needs of the day. On my second point, it's true that crises often trigger radical changes in regulation uh, and in, in, in governance framework generally, simply because they reveal uh, weak spots uh, in governance framework, as simple as that. And if we take the example of the previous crisis, the sovereign debt crisis, it indeed triggered a raft of changes in this framework. It led also to the creation of new institutions like the European Stability Mechanism as a permanent crisis management framework for the euro area. Why? Because in fact, the debt crisis uh, uh, badly revealed the toxic consequences of the lack of a crisis management framework. It led to a transfer of competence for, for banking supervision to the Union, and more specifically to the European Central Bank with the creation of the single supervisory mechanism. And why? Simply because 
the crisis revealed that decentralized banking supervision uh, revealed was 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 uh, you know in, inappropriate in an increasingly uh, integrated uh, financially integrated union. It also led to a revamp of economic governance, simply because the crisis revealed that improvident fiscal policies and nominal di divergences are simply not compatible with a smooth functioning of monetary union. But all these reform, all these uh, uh, institutional changes made the union stronger, the union and its member states stronger, and also better able to tackle the COVID-19 crisis as we have seen. And indeed, again, with this new crisis, with the COVID-19 crisis, we also had a renewed, renewed creativity in Europe, new steps toward European integration in a spirit of unity and solidarity. This creativity uh, on the design of the uh, union socioeconomic response was really driven by the leaders with regular video conferences of the European Council convened by President Michel to steer and coordinate efforts at national and European level through the crisis. Looking back, I think we can say the union did well. Among key decisions, you can list swift ECB monetary policy reaction early activation of the general escape clause of the stability and growth pact to provide room for manoeuvre uh, to member states, yeah. adaptation of the stated framework uh, by the commission to support private sector with public money, a EU program to support short-term employment, uh, short employment uh, to, to save jobs proposed by the commission, a pan European guarantee fund proposed by the EIB and a pandemic crisis support credit line proposed by the ESM. Last but not least, the European Council by unanimity agreed on a recovery package of 800 billion euros on top of the EU budget. And it agreed for the first time that the Union will, will borrow on the international financial markets to grants to, to provide not only loans, but also grants to member states, so transfers to member states. So this exceptional response, I, I would say, resulted from full alignment between the Union including all its institutions and all its member states to fight the pandemic. 10 months after this decision by the European Council on the recovery package, all member states have completed national par parliamentary procedures and notified the ratification of the own resource decision that allows the Commission to borrow on international financial markets. So very soon, the Commission will start to approve recovery plans and really early disbursement to member states are in the cards for this summer. Europe has shown unity, solidarity, and this has ensured financial stability of the Union and all its member states through this crisis. Now, looking forward, the question, the question of today, the question of the adequacy of our governance framework to the new post-COVID normal is absolutely legitimate. We are all aware that the strengthening of the fiscal rules that resulted uh, from the previous reform of the stability and growth pact, the six pack and the two pack, has already required the Commission to interpret the rule, to interpret the framework in the years that preceded the, the, the COVID 19 crisis. So, already in 2015, actually, so shortly after the uh, entry into force of these new regulations, the Commission came up with a communication in, entitled Making the Best Use of the flexibility within the existing rules of the stability on the path. So rule implementations, rules implementation has become increasingly complex. And indeed, stricter rules require interpretation by the Commission in, this, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the recent period. And this complexity somewhat led to a situation which I would characterize as a situation of cognitive dissonance whereby the actual implementation of the rules seem sometimes to be at odds with the letter of the rules. And of course, this leads to, I mean, communication problems, credibility problems, and also political difficulties. Today, it's not my intention to go into the detail of, the, of a possible reform of the pact, and I will rather count on the European Policy Center and your task force to, to come up with constructive proposal to feed the political Debates that will that is that is that is that will happen and is really needed to upgrade our economic governance framework to the next challenges. So, 
To conclude, what I would like to, to, to share with you is a few, a few additional observations first. Well, first observation, the crisis has led to a significant increase in government debt, but also to significant divergences across the debt ratios of member states. That's, that's the first observation. My second observation is that upcoming soci societal challenges for example, and first of all, the green and digital transition will require massive investments, both public and private. My third observation is that all the structural changes that have been set in motion by the COVID-19 crisis, as well as the green and digital transition, will have deep implications for the social fabric in Europe. And so uh, from these three observations, I would like to draw to, to ask three questions that I think are key for your rethinking of uh, and your analysis of the economic governance framework and the avenues that we should follow to reform it. The first question is how to adapt rules, how to adapt our rules to a new environment with significant cross-country divergences in public debt. And I think this question has two dimensions. So one is a question of fiscal sustainability, but the, the, second, the second dimension is a, is a question of fiscal stabilization. So in a nutshell, how can you ensure a satisfactory pass of debt reduction that is needed with the preservation, with preserving our ability to respond to economic shock that are, can be both symmetric and asymmetric? The second question is how to ensure our economic governance is fit for purpose when it comes to our green and digital ambitions. We know that in the coming years, next generation EU will is green, green on digital objectives and the allocation of funds on the next generation EU will provide incentives for green and digital investment. But we should make no mistake, the transition will take more than six years. So which coordination framework should we put in place to accompany or twin transition after next generation EU? And I think this concern in particular the treatment of public investment in our fiscal rules. Finally, how to best ensure our economic, economic governance supports social and political stability in the Union and its member states? You know, it's an important question and you have stressed it in your introductory statement, uh, Fabian, and I think uh, rightly so. Social and political stability are obviously essential underpinnings of, uh, of liberal democracies. The social dimension, social dialogue, the active involvement actually of social partners have always been at the core of a highly competitive social market economy. But it's also at the, one of the main foundation of the union back in the 50s. But today, social and political stability risk being jeopardized by the distributional impact of the green and, of, and, and digital transition if adequate flanking policies are not implemented at the same time. And I think as you, as you alluded to, I, I agree with you, uh, Fabian, that this is an important aspect that should be factored in when rethinking our economic governance framework. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for those opening remarks. Um, I think we've covered a lot of grounds and there, there are many areas uh, I want to follow up. Um, but I'll start actually with bringing in um, some of the analysts um, in the EPC who are working on these different areas um, to have a reflection as well. Um, and I will start uh, with Laura Rayner, who um, focuses on the social investment um, side, which you've just uh, concluded your remarks with. So Laura, if you could come in at this stage. Hi, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, yes, hi, I'm Laura Rayner. I'm indeed working on, on social investment in, in this task force. Um, what I just wanted to sort of make a, a bit of a comment in, on the back of that uh, intervention is, yeah, I, I think we, we can all agree that the pandemics revealed, you know, very serious deficiencies in the level of social investment and of basic services, whether that's healthcare, long-term care, education, um, active labour market policies. Uh, yeah, but exactly as you said, it, social investment is still going to be really crucial in smoothing the negative effects of the green and digital transitions. Um, and indeed, while the idea of a golden rule to exempt social investments from deficit calculations has been suggested for many years now, 
Um, and we've seen through the RRF that the pressure on investments to support green and digital transitions has lifted, albeit, as you mentioned, uh, just in your concluding questions with a rather short term horizon, because indeed many of these investments will need to happen over you know, the coming decades rather than the immediate future. Um, however, I would say that demographic change is a similarly massive transformational change that we need to face as a continent. And so therefore, I was just wanting to ask really, what would it not then be sensible to allow investment spending that, that specifically seeks to prepare us for the demographic shift to be exempt from deficit calculations, thereby helping us to increase resilience, but also to help support social cohesion? I'm thinking just as an example of, of the care sector, which has been, of course, battered over the last years, but which is already hugely important and, and will only increase in importance. And you know, not only in terms of preparing for demographic change, but also in terms of this being a good investment in itself. I know uh, re research done by the Women's Budget Group in the UK already calculated that an investment of 2% of GDP in care services in, in comparison to construction would create double the number of jobs in total. And I think there should also sort of raise the flag that while we invest in, in the green and digital transitions, which you know is unarguably important, we have to keep an eye on the gender disparities that this actually can create. Whereas indeed, uh, investing in care, uh, you know, sadly having to, to live with these gender stereotypes for the now um, would actually potentially help limit or reduce the, the gender disparities that we currently see. Yeah, I'll give you a chance to respond to that. Uh, so. Yeah, no, I, I mean, the, um, the, the, um, you know, I mean, this is something that's that's a kind kind of a, a difficult question. So I will not. I mean, this is something that needs to be analyzed very carefully because there are several, let's say, um, variables in the equation. So I mean, generally, I would agree that you know what is important is to increase. I mean, the share of let's say what I would say, a public expenditure with a positive social return can be. Social investment can be investment in the green in in uh, in the greening of the economy, but I mean we should not we should make no mistake. I mean there is still an equation with sustainability. So, in fact, what is important is that we find incentive to increase. I mean, uh, what I would say, productive investment or productive public spending, but it should not be kind of uh, um, uh, a way you know, to, to, to prevent actually consolidation on other categories of public expenditure that might be less necessary, I mean, for, uh, for to, 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 um, to, 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 um, to support, you know, to support, um, to, to support the economy or, or, or create, I mean, an appropriate macroeconomic environment. So there are, there may be, for example, transfers or social transfers that are not, you know, for various reasons, I mean, that are uh, being put in place in the past and that are there and that maybe should be reviewed as well. So, I mean, the fact that you exempt so in investment, public investment, whatever it is, or that you find conditions should not be, you know, the green light to do whatever you want and to increase further the deficits uh, in a way that you would risk fiscal sustainability. So this is where the the debate is, it's really a debate about the quality of public finances at the end of the day, right? And then, of course, because of that, the uh, implementation, the details of the rule, how you implement it, are extremely, extremely uh, delicate and also very political, because you might find a lot of public spending, actually, that you would say, but in fact, I mean, it's investment in the long term, so it should be exempted and it should not count in the deficit. But you can do it, but you should not forget that you still have the sustainability equation in the background that should be fulfilled. So this is a delicate balance, I think, one has to strike. Thank you very much. Um, bringing in Marta now. Um, yes, good morning. Um, my name is, is Marta Pilati. I'm also one of the analysts working on, on the task force. Um, many thanks really for, for your introduction, which was very comprehensive. Um, I just want to make a comment and maybe a follow up question to you on the, the potential review of the fiscal framework and, and the stability on growth pact. Um, I, like, I like what you said that the process of rethinking economic governance is, is a continuum, which is something I very much agree with. And indeed, I think there is 
clear evidence that the set of existing of existing rules can be can be improved. Um, and just to name a few of the issues that, that me and others see is that uh, the current framework has a short term orientation, it has a political pro cyclical bias, it limits the scope for public investment, um, it's not very fit for high levels of public debt. And there are also limitations when it comes to enforcement and, and transparency. Um, just to name a few, and of course, some of these issues, like you rightly said, have been exacerbated by the COVID crisis. Um, but of course, I think that the revision of the framework is a political matter, it's not a technical one. So what we need is a political argument, not a technical one. We need an argument that gets all the member states on board with the need for the revision of the rules. Um, mm. And, and I, I wanted to get your sense on this, because I, I think this argument can be that having the rule, rules that are repeatedly breached does not help anyone. And, and if the exception becomes the rule, like, like you said, in some cases, of course, it's necessary when, when rules are strict. If the exception becomes the rule, then the rule is not fit for purpose. Um, mm -hmm. And so, I, and so I believe that the new set of rules that are clearer, a bit more flexible, easier to enforce, should be in the interest also of those member states that have repeatedly complained that the rules are not respected. And so I wanted to get your view on this argument. And, and, and do you think there is scope for convincing the more reluctant governments that actually a revision of the fiscal rules is also in, in their interests? Um, and thank you very much for your view. No, I mean, generally, I mean, in Europe, if there were no way to bring together the position of member states, I mean, there would be no union at all. And so there is always a debate and where at the end of the day, it can be very long. Sometimes it takes decades, but uh, there is always a, a, at the end uh, of the road, a landing zone where, where member states agree. On your specific uh, point, I, 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 I agree with your, with your approach, um, which is by, by and large to say that, uh, you know, having a law that is not implementable, I mean, is actually completely, uh, it's a bit absurd. So if you, you can write a lot of laws, nobody uh, abide by the law is exactly equivalent to have no law. So if you have a strict, very strict law and it's not implemented, it's equivalent of having no law at all. And so what you say is that it's better to have a law that is less strict, but that you you can implement and so that uh, your behavior, behavior change. Having said that, I would like to make one observation is that we should also not uh, say that the framework that we have had has been ineffective. I think actually that this framework has led to a situation which is much better as far as fiscal policy is concerned in, Euro in Europe and in member states in the union as a whole. But there is this issue of cognitive, dis cognitive dissonance because the rules are very, in a sense, very strict. At least the letter of the rule is very strict. I think there, there is a way for improvement, but I also believe, as you, that it will be a, a complex and heated political debate because there are very strong priors uh, across member states. And also the situation might also be very different from one member state to, to the other. So this will, be, this will be, by definition, a complex debate. Uh, the question also is, uh, it will also very much depend on the degree of ambition in the revision of, of the rules themselves. Do you want really, I mean, a completely change of tack or do you adapt them uh, at some specific, for some specific element that you consider are, are most, uh, you know, are the most uh, visible one and that uh, you, can, you can address. That will depend a bit on the scope of uh, the revision and therefore it will very much depend on the outcome of the, of the review in the first place, I think. And the review still has to be made. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, is Frederico there? I can't see him on my screen, but maybe. Is in on with a different name. Um, if not, then um, I'll pick up a, a couple of points on the European semester as well. Um, mm. I, I think when we look at the European semester, I mean, the idea was uh, in essence to have a, a way of encouraging member states um, to uh, carry out reforms and uh, to follow uh, the, the broad uh, objectives which were being set at 
the European level. Now, in the past, many people have uh, criticized the effectiveness of the European semester um, and uh, have also pointed out that the resonance of the recommendations of the discussion at the national level has not been great. Um, now we have the link also to the recovery and resilience facility. Um, do you expect that changes uh, the debate around the European semester and uh, changes behavior of, of member states? Well, uh, well first, first uh, I mean, uh, I, I think, again, I mean, the, the fact that the framework, I mean, I should stress that again and again, the fact that the framework is not fully effective and that, you know, the, uh, the law is not strictly implemented in a sense doesn't mean that the law is ineffective. You know, I mean, the fact that you have a speed limit doesn't mean that everybody uh, drives under the speed limit, but it does uh, make on average the speed limit, uh, you know, uh, people driving on average uh, at a lower speed. So I think the framework has led already, I mean, uh, has already delivered a lot of, uh, of good things in, in, in member states. But I also believe, and that your point is, is correct, that with next generation EU, given that there is uh, this, uh, you know, show of uh, increased uh, European solidarity, there will be also, I mean, in fact, the process of scrutiny, in a sense, uh, with milestones and uh, decision for disbursement, in a sense, of this fund. So, I mean, I think it will shed a lot more light on the quality of the implementation of policies at member state level, because it comes with money. Yeah. And that will be also in the public debate, you know, I mean, in newspapers and so on and so forth, there will be more light on it. And, um, maybe as a follow up to that, then uh, it comes with money. Um, but the reality is still, and you mentioned that as well, that there is still huge cross country divergence um, and that uh, the capacity of some countries um, to invest, uh, to drive forward the transitions, to react to COVID-19 is still vastly greater. And we are also seeing that on um, a daily basis uh, in terms of state aids being dispersed and in terms of the interventions with one country in Europe, Germany, outspending everyone else uh, when it comes to this. Um, how do we address this? Uh, can we have an economic governance framework which works when we have that level of differences between the countries. But yes, I think in a sense we, we we already have one, and in fact, I mean, it, it it it. I mean, you know, if you take our governance framework, I mean, the first thing you could say in the context of the COVID nineteen crisis is that it worked. In fact, actually, uh, we the, the the general escape clause is a clause that is in our governance framework, and so in a sense, I mean we follow the rule book in this sense. The second thing is that because of these cross-country divergences and these difficulties, I mean, then, of course, the leader then had to take, to, to, to exert the leadership and to come up with a, a new instrument to address these issues. And now, I mean, we are at the stage of implementation of this new, new instrument and the allocation of funds uh, under Next Generation EU under the recovery um, and resilience facility is also very asymmetric, actually. And this is specifically to reflect the need and the starting position of member states. And also, I mean, how our, 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 our strongest have been affected by the COVID-19 crisis, in a sense. Huh? That, uh, I mean, uh, is also not completely independent from their initial situation, uh, their initial economic situation. So, yeah, I mean, by and large, I think, uh, we can and uh, and we will have to have a framework that uh, that allow us to manage. I mean, um, you know, these uh, these the current uh, the current situation. Looking forward, so I have no doubt that this will be uh, this will be handled one way or another. Um, but is it realistic to expect that we can go back um, to some form of repayment of the debt um, to a situation where the countries which are weaker and which are going to continue to be weaker uh, are in a position to be able to do that? Or do we not actually have to 
uh, whether we explicitly acknowledge that or not, uh, do we not have to create permanent mechanisms uh, which can address uh, these differences? The, uh, the mechanisms that have been, uh, you know, uh, adopted and uh, ratified by member states, I mean, are temporary in nature. So, I mean, there are these uh, next generation EU, I mean, as uh, will, will lapse in 2000, 2058. But 2058 is uh, almost in three decades, right? So who knows where we will be at that point in time? I think, you know, this is an history that still has to be written and it very much depends, I think. And that's why I insist on the quality of the implementation of the decisions that have already been taken. Because I mean, the quality of implementation of the decisions that have been taken today is a factor that will determine the decisions that will be taken tomorrow when new challenges arise. So, I mean, it's really kind of, I think, a dynamic, a dynamic, um, a dynamic situation. So it's not something like, you know, it's not a static, you, you don't start from a static situation, you don't start from a situation where all are in the same position, but you have to understand, I mean, the evolution of the tools that we have in a, in, in a, in a, in a dynamic framework. And but when, do, when you think about all these uh, I mean, economic governance that way, you understand sometimes why it's important to create new institution, you know, to stabilize some element, why it's important, I mean, to, uh, to abide by the agreement, because it will be a kind of an important element of trust in the union that will help further steps. But really, I mean, today, for me, the main focus should be on the implementation of uh, the recovery or resilience facility of next generation EU, to have strong recovery plans and to implement them strictly. And then I think that if it's done that way, you, um, you will be in, in a different situation in six years, actually. And then you will restart the debate. Thanks very much. Um, I've got a question here from Paul Taylor, uh, which I will read out. Um, uh, he asks, why not use the existing proven loophole for public investment used by Austria and now Germany to finance their autobahns, which involves public companies borrowing um, finance by future revenue streams from tolls and vignettes without being counted as general government debt. This could be extended to smart grids, offshore wind parks, transmet cables, high-speed broadband networks, etc. So essentially off-balance sheet borrowing um, against future income streams. Is this something which should be encouraged? I mean, I, I don't have a personal position on that. I mean, it's uh, first. I mean, there, I guess there are there must be also public-private partnership in the in this area. So it's a question. I mean, of uh, of uh, how you define. I mean, it's a statistical question. In fact, about the definition of uh, of uh, of general government, what enters on the balance sheet uh, and in government debt or not in, uh, in government debt. So. I mean, I would have to look more into the detail of this scheme to tell you what I think about them, to be honest. But uh, generally, I mean, there is, you could also, uh, you know, kind of uh, ask private companies, I mean, to, to develop, I mean, some of this network. And so you can also give that to the public sector, can be financed by the public sector and can be regulated by the government. So there are many ways of doing it. But it's a different question compared with, uh, with that of uh, generally of public investment. Huh? I mean, it's it's related, but it's not uh, it's not uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's not it's not exactly the question of the golden rule. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, I don't see any other questions at, at this moment, um, so uh, I will ask a question. Of course, if someone still wants to come in, um, then I, I will take it. Uh, but otherwise. Uh, I think we, we can also uh, conclude uh, at this point, but I wanted to ask a question also, which touches on the political a bit, um, mm -hmm. which has to do with the symmetry and the level of enforcement. Um, so one thing which has always been uh, in the background, certainly during the Euro crisis, was the question about uh, in how far uh, the rules, the guidance um, was applying equally uh, to different countries. Uh, those who, of course, were reliant on um, public investment also through the European um, funds 
have a very different incentive than those uh, who have the fiscal capacity themselves. Um, also this question about do we treat imbalances the same way? Um, do we treat surpluses the same ways as we treat deficits? Um, do we deal with macroeconomic imbalances the same way as we deal with fiscal imbalances? Uh, and is that something which has to be addressed uh, to create a governance framework uh, which all countries feel it applies to them and it also has teeth for all countries? No, that's uh, that's uh, uh, indeed actually the, a very difficult question. It's it's where it's, it's actually it's a political question also about perception. You know, it's, uh, it's also a question about perception. I, I think that the way um, the way the rules are implemented, I mean, uh, is kind of fair to to member states. To all member states they are not all in the same situation. It's also true that I mean there are uh, you know imbalances are not completely symmetric in a sense. So, I mean, if you are short of money, it's a different situation compared with the one where you have too much money. So the constraint is not exactly the same uh, to, 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 to be blunt. And, um, and the strength of the externality of the possible externalities is not the same either. So I think also one should consider and should not forget that uh, in the, our treaty, uh, member states are responsible for, for economic policy, actually, and for fiscal policy. And so we should not forget, I mean, that we are a collection of, of democracies and that the way you implement fiscal policy in country X or Y, I mean, is also primarily, I mean, in the interest of national citizens. And then the coordination framework is to make it, to make sure that it all adopts, adopt to a, to a, to a consistent framework, to a consistent policy. And that's this notion of economic policy coordination, if you wish. But we should not forget that it is a responsibility, it's a national responsibility, and that is democratically legitimized by national parliaments. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've got a few questions which have come in now. Um, uh, Robin, um, maybe you can ask the question also in person um, if we can unmute you. Hi, um, thanks, um, uh, Fabian. Thanks. Um, Monsieur Vidal for, for the intervention. I mean, my, my question is, is basically on the, the kind of political level, political dynamics these days. I mean, if, if you start from the, assumption, from the assumption that at the domestic level, the kind of main targets today, main objectives are reviving growth, addressing investment needs, rising, you know, basically employment rates. Um, is there not a risk that by failing to find, you know, a collective solution, this may lead to new fragmentation of a single market? I mean, this is a very basic, fundamental question, but um, the priorities seem to be really elsewhere at the, at the domestic level at times, as, as there may be. So, uh, yeah, I'm just wondering the extent to which you're also kind of uh, considering that aspect on, on, on the radar these days. Thanks. Okay. Could you please be more precise? What, what, which risk do you see to the to the single market, and uh, which which typically, mechanics would lead to this risk? So typically, if you would if you would if you would imagine um, mm -hmm. uh, countries which tend to rely on growth models like uh, or growth strategies that foster uh, employment through domestic demand, um, mm -hmm. and you know, and the, the kind of recovery phase that we're going to be seeing, they. Mm -hmm. Be willing to, you know, push through through very, mm. um, you know, state uh, activist uh, kind of policies, the mm -hmm. kind of policies that may be more protectionist or that may, you know, kind of at, at some point also uh, threaten the competition of other EU member states to enter on, onto their own kind of domestic markets and so on. So as a result, you see as a kind of second order effect, mm -hmm. just the fact that there is more focus on, you know, domestic growth. Mm -hmm. um, the risk of new barriers emerging on the single market, and um, yeah, this is certainly something that might be. Uh, no, you know, okay, I understand the question now very, very well. No, I think I mean, uh, but for you know, I mean, there are risk of tensions. I mean, that's but that's always the case. I mean, in all uh, in all uh, you know political environment and uh, 
uh, it's in a sense that's normal, but I mean, we have the advantage in Europe that uh, both uh, competition policy and uh, and trade are union competencies. So in that, in fact, rein in these, uh, let's say, nationalistic tendency or these uh, inward looking policies that you alluded to. And that's, you know, it's it's extremely important to, uh, to, to, uh, to remember that there are a number of competencies that are at union level and that therefore they, de they deliver, in fact, uh, uh, more uh, harmonized, harmonized policies through the union. Of course, I mean, there always are, there are tendencies or there might be critics. I mean, it can be for competition policy, it can be for trade, you will find critics. You will also find critics for monetary policy, but at the end of the day, these are union competencies. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we have a question from Eamon Noonan. Uh, is it possible to get more detail on what kind of public spending is likely to fail an efficiency test and what kind is likely to pass in the context of a golden rule? Hmm. That, uh, I mean, uh, I, I, that's that's a question that I mean you we really requires I mean a kind of impact of assessment I mean uh, the, the, you know if you have task forces uh, you also you also have to work I mean in your task force it's, it's not it's not so easy but I mean I think if you take it from you know like kind of the broad political objectives of the union you would say that if you want really I mean to if you if you are serious about greening the economy and the digitalization of the economy, then it's obvious that there is a need for massive investment. I mean, it has to be not necessarily only public investment, but I mean, public investment will also be needed to kickstart and to develop, I mean, these new, you know, these new industrial sectors or these, these new green industrial sectors, I mean, to, to foster, I mean, the digital economy and so on and so forth. So there you could, you could consider, I mean, to, you know, to earmark, I mean, a certain number of public uh, um, of uh, public investment items that are related to these uh, to these uh, overarching union objective as good candidate to be part of you know a specific treatment under the rule whatever the specific treatment is because i mean there are different ways of doing it huh? not necessarily full exclusion but i mean to provide further incentive that goes in the direction of uh, of the policies you want to to implement and uh, that that would be my, my answer. But really, I mean, it's a, it's a technical issue. Uh, the first uh, first of all, I mean, it's uh, and there is work being done on that. But there is also a need to have, a, you know, a, as usual, a classification. I mean, of public expenditure among several type of category, including for public investment, in a sense uh, that you and that's also one of the uh, progress that we will have. Uh, in the context of next generation EU is because of these uh, objectives in terms of uh, spending at least 37% um, uh, of the recovery and resilience facility on green and 20% on digital that have been set by, uh, by the leaders. I mean, then you will have the necessity to be, you know, to, to monitor uh, what is the objective of uh, public investment, whether they are green, digital, and so on and so forth. I mean, gradually, I think we will put the framework, framework in place that would allow for this kind of specific treatment. But I mean, a lot of work still has to be done and a lot of impact assessment without forgetting sustainability. And point very well taken that uh, there is a lot of work which needs to be done um, and that is certainly something we want to do also in the task force uh, defining what what is social investment how could a golden mm -hmm. rule work how can it be measured uh, mm -hmm. and to make sure that uh, it is meaningful um, that it actually does uh, portray something uh, which can then be applied uh, in a framework Although it has to be said that um, we already called for this a number of years ago, and I think this is part of uh, the process that maybe now is also the time um, to mm -hmm. really put these processes into place. Um, uh, we have had a tendency to postpone some of these discussions, um, and I think that uh, is uh, problematic when we then need uh, to move forward. Um, I have a question uh, directly uh, related to the new economic governance framework, uh, which is rather short, um, but it might be difficult to answer. Uh, what would be 
uh, a realistic calendar to adopt the new economic governance framework, and that's from Jose Perez Santander. Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, first, I mean, you need the review, and then uh, I think, yeah, the, the, it's a, it's an excellent question. And there are two issues. I mean, one is that, of course, um, the new framework, in a sense, I mean, or the way the direction of uh, of discussion will provide, I mean, some indication on, you know, the path of uh, the future path of uh, fiscal policies, in a sense. So. As an economist, I would say that it should not come too late. It should not come too late. At least a broad sense, I mean, to give a sense of direction would be important relatively early on. So I think uh, that would be two steps. I think first, I mean, there is a need for this review by the commission and there is a need for political discussion. But then I would uh, recommend, I mean, thereafter to come to a conclusion on the board, you know, uh, send, uh, to give a broad sense of direction on where we are going on. For the time being, on fiscal policy, there is a broad consensus in the union about the need to for fiscal support. But obviously, I mean, with the recovery taking uh, strength, uh, it will uh, there will be a need to provide, I mean, further, further, uh, further um, guidance on the future course of policy at some point. And I do believe that, I mean, indeed, the work on the framework uh, will may also help doing so. But that will, uh, you know, then you don't control necessarily the, the next step. I must say is that to be aware that uh, in here, I mean, this is a revision of uh, frameworks that consist of a set of regulations that are decided on the co-decision. Uh, so, I mean, you need or you will, there will also be a need for parliamentary time. There will be a need for discussion in the council and so on and so forth, according to our usual procedure. So that might take time, right? I mean, this legislative time, I mean, is uh, usually can be long and sometimes very short, but when there is emergency, if there is no emergency, it can take time, I mean, to, to find uh, the proper landing zone. But if you have the broad sense of direction, I think that's fine. Um, you, you were talking about legislative procedures there, um, maybe as a follow-up. Uh, what about treaty change? Um, do you envisage that the discussion could go in that direction as well? I mean, some people will argue for it. I mean, the question is whether there, there, is, there will be a political appetite for it. And the second question, I mean, but that's uh, uh, that I am asking myself, and that's my my person to all that as all my personal views actually, uh, really. But the point is that you know, I mean, in Europe, I mean, we change the treaty. Uh, more than once already and the question is that if you were to change it i mean would you change it only for the fiscal aspect or would you go beyond and then the, the question is that is this political discussion between member states between all of us sufficiently advanced to be able to do so so I, again i mean fabian it's a, it's a dynamic process i have no doubt that one day we will change the treaty or we will amend the treaty or the question is really when. If you ask me uh, whether it will come next year, I would say, well, it's the problem, the likelihood of it is very, very uh, small, <laughs> to say the least. Now, if you ask me, are we going to change the treaty by 2050, for example? And then I would say, well, that maybe, maybe the, the likelihood is much higher. Thank you very much. Um... Uh, we've reached the end of time for our discussion today, um, but certainly not uh, the end of the discussion on the economic governance framework. Mm. And uh, we will be very happy to also engage with you, Jean-Pierre, uh, in our task force uh, and certainly in the recommendations which we're coming up with. Um, but for now, uh, thank you very much um, for being here for the launch event. Um, and we will be in touch. Also, uh, thank you very much to everyone who has taken part today. Uh, and I'm looking forward to continuing this discussion in the coming month. Thank you very much. And thank you to all participants. And um, you have a lot of work in front of you, Fabian and your team. Thank you. Thanks, thank yeah. you. Thanks.